Okay, so today we are joined by the Matt Morton. Uh, Matt Morton, the Matt Morton. The one and only. <laughs> Matt, how are you? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Awesome, yeah, really good, really good, really good. So I'm, I'm saying the Matt Morton because that is your social handle. I'm guessing, is that because Matt Morton was taken or is it because you are I, the Matt Morton? I would like to say that it was cleverly planned uh, <laughs> in advance of all of the recent media activity, but actually, no. Uh, it used to be Mort's, which is my nickname. Yep. Uh, I decided to change it at, at some point a few years ago. Uh, and uh, Matt Morton was taken. So was Matt Morton 16, which is my football number. So uh, I just thought, I wonder whether the Matt 16 Morton... is a football number. It's not the conventional football number, but Roy Keane, who is my... Of uh, course, number 16. Team. Even I know that. There you go. There you go. And uh, did Robson... No, Robson was eight, wasn't he? Uh, Robson was seven. Robson was seven. That was Eric Cantona. Ince was eight. And, and then Cantona. Yeah, Ince was eight. Yeah, so Man United 7 has a lot of history to it. George Best, David Beckham eventually. He was 10 first, but then he got 7. Eric Cantona had the 7 before Beckham. And yeah, Brian Robson. So, yeah. There you go. I'm sure my very limited football knowledge there from back in the day when, when everybody had to have a football team they followed or supported, right? You know, so that's my history. Exactly. I remember Schmeichel and Ince and all those, like Bruce and... All those guys. Anyways, anyways, we're not here to talk about football. Well, we might actually talk about a bit about football because football kind of carves into your history and your background and yeah, everything about you, really, doesn't it, in many respects. But obviously what we want to do is we want to talk about, which we do on the Human 24 podcast, we want to we want to talk about you. We want to talk about what drives Matt Morton. We want to know a bit about history, a bit about you know your, your key drivers and how you've come about the success you have because we've known each other for a short while now i we had we had quite a lengthy conversation uh one day about kind of background history little snippets of this that the other which was intriguing and obviously there was a whole load of stuff missing that probably i don't know about yeah and every guest that i have on i know most of my guests uh in some way shape or form and inevitably i end up learning so much about them so much more about what drives them and and, and ultimately leads to further admiration as to, you know, how they've got to where they've got to. So a little bit of your history that I know. So you've been in the health and health and wellness sector, I guess, for most of your days, right? Since you, since you uh, yep. graduated, finished school, finished college. Again, I, I, I don't know about your educational sort of background, but you, I know that you went straight and you started working for Life Fitness. Is that right? Life Fitness. Then you went to Escape Fitness. You were there for quite a long time, 10, 10 plus years. Ten and a half years. Yeah. Ten and a half years. And now you're at Amplify, which is very clear to see, which yeah. we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Amplify uh, towards the end because, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a business I've got a huge amount of interest in. And so let's start at the beginning, Matt. Let's, let's, let's go all the way back. I know you've got a really good, you know, you've got a really good mindset, very driven uh, in in sports, fitness, business. So you're one of those people, again, you know, you fit the perfect mold of the, the kind of guests that we, we like to get on here, are people who carry that over into different aspects of the life, you know, that same mindset and mentality. So tell me a little bit about Matt, you know, when he was younger, Matt has gone through and those defining moments that have given you that drive that you have today. Yeah, I guess my upbringing is a massive part of that. Um, so for, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, I was born and bred in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, a uh, little county in the east of England, uh, right on the border of Essex and Cambridge. So you kind of get different stereotypical traits from, from all those. <laughs> the aristocrat of Cambridge can come out in the voice that I'm probably speaking in now. On a football pitch, he's more the Essex Matt Morton. <laughs> Not necessarily... Is that an optional thing or is that like a... a, a... It's a subliminal thing. Yeah, it, it, it kind of, I don't know whether it's because I've always been surrounded by lots of different types of people from lots of different walks of life. Yeah. Uh, like a chameleon, I kind of adapt my voice a, a little bit. So I, I become guess, more Northern when I'm talking to a Northerner. I, I start <laughs> using really strange. I, I remember as a, a kid, my mum used to tell me who I'd been hanging around with that day. She used to be like, you've hanging around with such and such. I said, how do you know that? She goes, oh, your dialogue's changed. Yeah, it's funny. Right. So I've always found that quite fascinating. So you have these two kind of personas, yeah, the foot on the football pitch, yeah, and the business persona. I'm assuming. 
Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, the football persona is is better than it used to be. When I when I was first playing, uh, the angry Matt Morton was probably a better Instagram handle than <laughs> the, Matt the angry Matt Morton. <laughs> um, Did you try and get that one? <laughs> no, but I probably should have done. I probably should've. angry Matt Morton. <laughs> Just as a completely separate profile page. Uh, right, I'm going to go off on a tangent right now because of that. So the angry Matt Morton. So so. Where did that come from? You know, so there's, there's clearly, you know, in sport, there's an, you know, a lot of sports require a level of aggression, I guess, a level of tenacity, a level of, you know, whatever it might be. But you've, you've just stated to me, and I think this is always important when, when somebody states that they are a certain character, a certain way, I think it's, it's important to kind of dig into that because there is clearly something that drives that, right? So angry Matt Morton, where did angry Matt Morton come from? Where did that, where was that born and, you know, how did it come about? I think ultimately it, it came from two things. It came from the will to win and the desire to win. And that was how I channeled that. Uh, very competitive. Um, I, I could not stand drawing, let alone losing as far as sport or fitness goes. I used to be, I, I am better now, by the way, but I used to be the type of guy that I would play. I'm better, like, it, like it's some kind of ailment. Yeah, well, it could, it could be at times, um, but we won't go into some of those stories. But it, it was certainly the type of character that if you challenge me to a game of tiddlywinks, uh, it would be an ultra competitive game of tiddlywinks. I would want to beat you. Now, the reality is I don't care about tiddlywinks. But back then, for that short moment of time, I would just because it was something to win. There has to be a winner. There has to be a loser. Okay. And I was just ultra determined to make sure that I was always on the winning side. And where do you think that stems from? Was that... Were you always like that at school? Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one. So anything I cared about, I gave my all to. So I, and I am still that character now. If I care about something, it gets 100% effort, 100% focus, completely driven. I mean, even things like having our company logo on my home office wall, that to me is, is you're either in completely or you're not in at all. Uh, what's, what's the point of giving any of your time to something if you're not going to give all of your effort to it? So it definitely stems from that. However, I'm not going to claim that I was in everything. So geography at school and French at school, I was not in at all. <laughs> I mean, you'd be lucky if I was in the classroom, let alone if I was... But they weren't choices, right? 100% choice. We're talking about like GCCs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The GCC, you didn't get a choice. I'm, I'm assuming everybody had to do geography and history. Everybody had to do a language of some, some description, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I, guess I, can, it, I can completely relate to that. There's certain subjects where I was like, nah, not so much. Yeah, I, I guess. But you, you could also argue that if you challenged me to a game of Tiddlywinks 10 years ago, I would have a choice of whether to play or not. And I would always chosen to play it and to try everything that I possibly can to win it. Whereas nowadays, Phil, if you challenged me to a game of Tiddlywinks, I'd say, no, you're all right. I've got other things I'd rather do. Do you want to play football, though? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm definitely more selective of, of where I place my energy and what I get competitive over. Yeah. That competitiveness will always be there. But now that competitiveness has been challenged to be completely focused on amplifying business, on, on football and the team I'm playing for, um, and, and anything else that I really have passion for. Okay. So again, you know, let's, let's, let's go back. Let's have a look at that. So, You've got this kind of competitive side, which then stemmed into what you say is angry Matt Morton. When in fact, was it just a, a competitive thing where if you were losing or, you know, that, that, that aggression would build up because you weren't kind of getting your own way, right? It's almost like a, a, a child that doesn't get their own way. You have a, a little bit of a fit or a bit of a paddy or whatever it might be. Was it, was it that kind of thing or was it just simply, you know, even if you were winning, you were still an aggressive, you know, player or an aggressive uh, business person or whatever it might be even if even if i was willing to be honest it, it i'm not going to say i'd never had the traits of if it was going against me i would be worse i mean i think there's definitely something in that but i think a lot of it and, it, and, and i guess i said at the beginning didn't i that there were two parts to this one of them was the will to win and the desire to win but the other one i think i've always had this innate need in me to lead from the front and i think if i'm the most vocal i'm the most aggressive uh, I'm the one that looks like he cares the most and does ultimately care the most. Everyone else will follow. And, you and where do you think that comes from? I'm getting reminders here that we've got a podcast, by the way. That's what's beeping in the background. So I do apologize. Uh, so, so where do you think that came from? Lots of different things. I think ultimately my dad and my mum, 
okay. are, are winners in their own way. My mum is <clears throat> fiercely competitive uh, in things that she is passionate about. Uh, she doesn't have many passions in life, bless her, but, but the things that she is, she's all in. And, and certainly when it comes to her faith, for example, um, she is fiercely competitive in defending her beliefs and, and her yeah. uh, points of view on that, often clashing with me, actually, um, particularly nowadays. But that passion and that competitive spirit that she's got in the form of aggression, I've definitely got some of that. My dad is not aggressive in the same way. Um, so he's not loud and, um, and, and what you'd call traditionally aggressive. He's very considered, very calm, uh, but very competitive in his own way. My dad doesn't lose. Uh, he, he is a winner uh, in business, in, in life, in everything. Yeah. But he does it quietly. He's very uh, considered. He's very strategic. Uh, and, and I've kind of looked at both of those characteristics and ways of doing it since, obviously, as long as I can remember. And I think I've taken parts of both of that. I don't think one without the other necessarily provides ultimate success in, in my view. Whereas I think if you can combine the two and be aggressive quietly at the right time and, and, and aggressive uh, loudly at other times, depending on the environment, then that's how you do it. So for example, in business and in football, I'm equally competitive, equally driven, um, but, in very different ways. Yeah. I, I think in business I've always, and if you ask anyone that's, that's worked for me in any of my teams or even at Escape, the, the rest of the board of directors around me, they would actually maybe accuse me of, certainly the board, of, of being too patient with staff or uh, wanting to um, keep them in the business probably longer than they might have done uh, and protecting that staff. There's definitely a loyalty in me as well but uh, I think that comes from wanting to lead and wanting to bring people along that journey with you. That doesn't mean that if somebody's not up to the job, I haven't moved people on or moved them into different areas. That, that certainly happens. Yeah, yeah. You have to if you want to be successful in business. You have to be able to do that. But if there's hope for somebody and, and their, their, I guess, attitude is right and on brand and what you need... I think we have a responsibility to train people that work for us and to improve people that work for us as well. And that's both on a football pitch as a coach and in business as a, as a manager or a director. I think, you know, you've almost tied them two together where you've, you've ultimately talked about sort of nature versus nurture, right? With your parents in that you've got certain traits of, of one and certain traits of the other, and you've kind of got this hybrid, this blend of blend of both. And then you've also talked about business in the same way and that and then you've got that nature versus nurture thing in, in, in business where if somebody doesn't quite get it, i.e. doesn't get the brand, doesn't get the, the, the company culture, doesn't quite get the, you're prepared to work with them and almost nurture that to the point that you probably need it. So again, that, it seems like that's kind of carried over into your life, that nature and nurture sort of aspect where you've learned certain things from one of your parents, certain things from really you've drawn what you wanted to draw out of them and then, and then applied that to your own sort of, you know, your own sort of psyche. So was there anything along that kind of process moving away from kind of your parents and your, you know, your, your friendship circles and your peers and those kind of things? Because obviously they all play that influence, right? Is that your parents can only do so much, you know, who you're surrounded by, your schooling, uh, the people around you, the positivity or negativity of them, you know, it is, it, you know, Bury St. Edmunds, I don't know a great deal about, but, but, you know, what was the surroundings like as a, as a kid where you're surrounded by people who wanted to improve, wanted to drive things forward, wanted to move on? Or were you surrounded by people who maybe had that kind of small town mentality where they just wanted to stay put, they just wanted to do what everybody else did, get a job, you know, have a couple of kids, whatever it might be, you know, whatever that norm was kind of categorized as. Did you feel that you were almost rebelling against that? Or did you feel that that was that was just wasn't for you or was that something that you weren't surrounded by? Was it a very progressive kind of upbringing with respect to your peers and the area that you were in? Do you felt, do you feel that that, you know, carved some of that out for you or do you think you just built that yourself, you know, through reading, education, whatever it might be, or the people you chose to surround yourself with? I think all of the above, I, I think ultimately when you look back at your life, you, you then start to realize the influences that have been had on you over those years while you're, while you're shaping your character ultimately you're starting with your parents and your family members then with your friends then with your schools then with your 
businesses and offices and, and environments that you've worked in as well as uh, sport. Barry St. Edmunds is an interesting uh, pool, if, if you like. So I had the fortune or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, of having two very different educational upbringings. So my, my dad was very successful um, and wanted the best for his family. He came from a working class background. Uh, like you, he was born in the north. Uh, like you, he relocated down to the south. Uh, he actually was raised in Wisbeach, which is not, uh, apologies to anybody that, that is from Wisbeach or lives in Wisbeach, but it's not my favourite place in the world. Um, he was, I don't actually know where it is. Where is Wisbeach? In Finland. In Finland? Uh, Finland. Uh, so Nor Norfolk, um, yeah, Norfolk area. So, Hence we were talking before about geography and history being optional. Geography was obviously was one of my opt-outs. Yes, actually it was for me also. But. but it's actually a funny thing because when people say geography is not a strong point, I don't think somebody who was good at geography would necessarily know where that was either. Possibly not. No, Possibly or, not. Or admit to it. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was born in the northeast in um, County Durham, uh, which I'm sure you know where that is. Yeah, yeah. And he came down to Wisbeach, uh, single, um, only child, sorry. Uh, his dad was in the army. Um, and, and very old school. His mother was a very nurturing uh, mother. She, she was working mother, um, but she looked at my dad as her blue-eyed boy. He could do no wrong. Uh, yeah. you know, her, her only child. And that, that actually carried on throughout his whole life. We used to joke about it, but my nan would come round when I was growing up for you know, a few days or a week at a time every, every few months and spend some time with us or I would go up there and stay with her for a few days. And you know, we had a great relationship with, with my dad's mum, but it was, a, it was a running joke in the family that no matter what he did, he was not in the wrong. It's, it's interesting because I actually had this discussion with someone you know, just, just in the last couple of days about this whole thing about you know, mothering almost where you know, how it, can, how it can go drastically wrong, but it can also drastically right as well, mm. in, that, in that there's a the real fine line there between how much you almost mollycoddle your kids in, the, in that they don't become dependent, you know, on, you know, outside of, the, they feel that they're safe all the time. Mm. And this is a, a topic that, you know, in, in most of the podcasts that we do, we talk about almost hardship, right? Is that, that they're almost, you, you want to keep them away from that. You want to keep your, your, your siblings, you want to keep your family, you want to try and remove people from hardship, right? And, you know, we, were, we work hard and everybody works hard because ultimately someone down the line is going to benefit from that, right? It's not just about us. Uh, certainly in, the, in, in most cases, it's about, you know, f further down the line. And there's that kind of, do you molly cuddle someone to the point that they don't go out and they're productive? But what appears to what you've said here is that, he was this blue eyed boy and, you know, was, was looked after and couldn't do any wrong, blah, blah, blah. But still ended up with his mindset where he was very driven, very business orientated. And, and, and again, you know, you've clearly learned from that. And that's something that you've observed as you've been growing up, right? Do you know what I think it is? I, I think that there are certain things that you, you, you are born with certain characteristics, I believe. And there are certain things that you learn. And there's always a balance between those two that will determine, you know, your personality uh, um, how you go about life. I think with my, my dad and myself, we both had that to a point where you've had one kind of stricter parent that, that, that's maybe yeah, yeah. soft and then the other one who, who is very soft or, or, or very um, affectionate. I had that as well. My dad's actually the more affectionate one. He takes up more after his mother. Um, he's uh, very tactile, loves a hug and a kiss with his kids. Uh, he, even now, um, and, and he's very emotional. Which again, uh, for that generation is quite, quite bizarre, right? Yeah. That, that, that was a very hard generation that, that, that our parents, you know, certainly were, were similar ages in that our parents were brought up in, in this kind of, you know, you just suck it up, you get on with it. And I think that that's part of the, you know, the, the challenge that we have nowadays in that that generation almost doesn't get millennials, doesn't get the new generation. And obviously the, the outlook on life is very, very different, right? It was, you know, people talk about mental health, people talk about all these different things, which I'm sure we'll get into, but it's, it, it was a different mentality. It was almost like, you know, if you're a man, you don't do this. It, absolutely. I mean, right? we, we can get onto that whole con, uh, preconceived idea and misconception of what masculinity is later. Um, I've definitely got a lot to say on that. 
But um, his dad ultimately was exactly what you're describing. He, he was very loving, but loving in the sense of wanting to be a provider. Yeah. His love was shown through, I'm going to go to war for my family. Yeah. I, I'm going to come home and, and put food on the table for my family. I'm, I'm the breadwinner. That's how I show my love. I don't need to hug and kiss you and tell you how amazing I think you are. In fact, if anything, all of that makes me very uncomfortable because I'm a man. That was very much his parents, the chalk and cheese. But, for but detract from that, take away the, 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 the masculine element of that, but that, that, that mentality of, I want to provide right? So take that. That exists in you. And I know that because, because I know you well enough to know that is that you have this, this drive to provision, right? Is that your, your provision in business, you know, you're, you're, you're part of a team, you know, you, again, sport wise, I think we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit as well is that sport wise, from what you've told me, most of the stuff is team sports, right? Yes. Is that you're part of a, a group of people who need to be brought together, who need to be led, who need to then be, you know, brought into this fray of you need to provide for everybody around you if you provide for everybody around you and you know this is the dynamic of team sports isn't it is that ultimately everybody wins right and and you take away that whole old school mentality well is it old school or is it just just it's just how it was right is that this is what you have to do you have to go out you get a job you do this and blah 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 right Mm -hmm. so you know that's clearly some of that is carried over to you yeah, which I think yeah, is, a, yeah. is, a, is a positive, right? Is, that, is that, that provision I need to provide for whoever it may be, you know, whether it's my grandparents, my parents, my, my family, my kids, my, whoever. But yeah, it's a provision thing, right? I completely agree. And I think that the result is the same and the motivation is the same. I think the characteristics that are wrapped around a, mo- a modern individual yeah, yeah. versus a previous generation of individual with rats around those are completely chalk and cheese and ultimately did my granddad and me want the same things which was to provide for those that you care about to provide a better life for those that you care about to, i mean him, he went to war which is obviously the extreme and, and i'm sure that part of the motivation for that with him would have been not just for his family but actually to make the world a better place and and this is our country and we're yeah, going- very stoic kind of you know i'm serving my country here I'm serving my fellow man. I'm serving my family. I'm serving, you know, and it was this service of, you know, th- this is what you do, right? And this is what, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I talked to my son about this and it, I said to him, it's look, if, if you were born in a different generation, you could potentially be going to war in a year or two. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, and that's a, a major thing, right? And obviously nowadays, nobody's worried about that anymore. You know, you're not worried about all of a sudden getting drafted as a 15 year old and being sent off to war and being expected to, you know, potentially kill people, right? And, and, and defend with your life, right? But this comes back into, uh, and maybe I'm getting into it a bit earlier than you would have liked to or that I was planning to, but this, this whole thing about masculinity, it, it's a complete enigma of a subject because back then, you would have been the things that you would have been afraid of as a man are the things that actually on paper you would look at now in the modern world and think hang on a minute you're actually relatively excited about the proposition of going to war risking your life getting shot at potentially dying because you're a man and you're protecting the country and you're doing it for in your mind all the right reasons the country the family making the world a better place in, in the fight against injustice. But back then what you'd have been scared of is the idea of being viewed by your peers as soft because you hug and kiss your children, feminine if you happen to be gay. You wanted to be perceived as a man and anything other than that was, was something that was scary to you. Internally, that was a fear. But the idea of going to war was actually not. But was it exciting? Or do you really think that, do you think that it was just a, it was just, because we talk about facades, right? You know, the world's full of facades, right? Everybody's putting this facade on everything. Social media is a prime example, right? Yeah, absolutely. That people put this facade on. And again, we'll, we'll talk about this with you because ultimately, you know, you spend a lot of, a lot of your life with almost like a facade that you just hadn't kind of worked out yet, right? Yeah, I guess but, so. And it, and it was this, this whole thing that kind of made you feel probably uncomfortable right we we were digging into this a bit more and you know you give me a total take on this but it was 
you know, it was this facade that these guys were going to war, going to get shot at, potentially die. I can't, I can't think that deep down they were probably excited about it. I mean, you'd, you'd have to be of, of some kind of serious sort of mental, uh, uh, not disposition is the wrong word, isn't it? Of a certain psyche to go, I'm excited about that. When in fact, maybe my peers and my, my people around me expect me just to be, oh yeah, I'm going to war and this is what it's all about. And it, it was that thing that you're talking about and what you're touching on, which is this expectancy of masculinity, right? Yeah. You go back then and even in, in the modern age, right? It's just, it's just uh, expressed in a different way, isn't it? It's whereas now it's like to be male is like you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do the other. I don't mean excited at the proposition of being in the trenches and, and actually having the bullets flying over your head. I don't think there's a human in existence that ever went to war that <laughs> experienced that that was excited by it and not terrified. Sure, there probably is. Well, I'll be, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not in that heat at the moment. But, but <laughs> what I'm talking about, I guess, is the excitement of being able to say you're going to war. The excitement of, of meeting that expectation of society. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I'm defending you lot. I'm, I'm, I'm your protector. I'm your provider. That yeah. ultimately is the root of all of this masculinity subject. It's being a provider, being a protector. And people were often less scared. Or, well, they were more prepared to go through things to achieve that, even if they did scare them. So going to war, yes, you're right. It's, it's going to be scary, regardless of how you know, the, the level is, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. it's going to be scary, but so many people prepared to do that, even when it wasn't mandatory, prepared to do that and excited by the proposition of being able to enhance their masculinity as a result. So it's that perception of what society thinks. So do you think, think that was like a stereotype thing? Yes. I think it was a thing where, you, you know, there was this stereotype of a man, this stereotype of a woman, this is the way you dressed, this is the way you acted, this is the, what you did, you know, it was a bit like, uh, you know, you go through almost like trends like like smoking right once upon a time smoking was trendy right so it was like it was seen as a a big thing to be to be smoking because it was trendy and you know and it it's trends it's stereotypes it's perceptions it's it's society it's peers it's all those different things accumulated together and it all plays its part right and obviously you know the, those molds have been slowly sort of chipped away and gone well hold on this could apply to men or women or it could apply to you know there's no there is no kind of, well, I guess there probably is still exists this stigma of females being the provider, you know, women being the provider. There know. is, there is still stereotypes in society for all of the things that there always has been. Yeah. There, yeah. There is a stereotype for uh, black men. There is a stereotype yeah. for gay men. There is a stereotype for gay women. Yep. There is a stereotype for business women uh, and white males. They all exist. They have changed slightly and they've changed for the better. But there now, there now is this, I guess, scenario where depending on your generation, your upbringing, your location, uh, and what ethnic minority or sex you belong to, your stereotype is different from each other's. Whereas of course, yeah, because then we, we, we start to get into and the point I was talking about to you before about your nature and nurture, and obviously where you were brought up, right, mm -hmm. is the, the, the Bury St. Edmunds stereotype of what a, a teenage you know, a teenage boy or girl does with their future. You know, I grew up in a, in a, in a small northern town. It was like, there's this stereotype of what, this is what you do, you know? And then probably the generation just before me, uh, you know, a few years before me, people started to leave the town and go to university and further education. And it was just this weird thing. And I remember the, you know, when you saw somebody who came back from university at Christmas, it was like, oh my God, that person went to university. And it was this, it was this just non-stereotypical thing of what someone would do. And, and when, you know, we're only talking 20 years ago here. Yeah. You know, and, and that has now evolved massively in that time. And I think there's been so many other things that have evolved massively, obviously still in that evolutionary process, very much so. And obviously, you know, what, what we'll talk about is, is, you know, you've been in the news a lot of late, you've been talking about stuff and, 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 a huge topic that is part of that evolutionary process, right? Which is all of a sudden these things are okay. And these things are still in that process of evolution. And, and you know, you're part of that and you've made yourself very much a part of that, haven't you? And, and, and I think this is where that, that staunch sort of attitude that you have and that, uh, that mindset that you have of, look, I'm all in. 
uh, I, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. Yeah. And, and if I'm going to stand for something, I'm actually going to stand for something. I think that's something in today's society really lacks is that people aren't really sure what they stand for. Mm. Is that they're really kind of on the fence. Is that, and, I, and I think there's also this, this real cry for help that a lot of people have is that, is that they're, there's almost, I'm not going to be stereotypical, but, but I'm going to be so out there that I'm not actually entirely sure myself what's going on. You know, so they're, they're almost indefinitely on the fence, right? As to, as to what their views are, their opinions or whatever it might be. And I think that's exacerbated by social media a lot, but, but ultimately it, it is this evolutionary process, right? So you've, and again, this conversation that we've had, you know, and, and we had, you know, pretty much, you know, when we first met really, yeah. it's about this evolution of Matt Morton. So all of a sudden in life, your life just changed, right? Just quite dramatically. Yeah, an aspect of it did. So what's really interesting about that, it, I think everyone expects it to be this big life-changing moment. It was a short-term change. So actually, my life is relatively back to normal, barring obviously talking about the subject in the media. My football interactions, my playing, my managing, all exactly the same. My business life, uh, my commercial commitments, my family life, my friendship, all relatively the same as prior, all had an, an element of being disturbed during you know, the, the various stages of telling different people uh, along that journey. Um, I am a gay man. That was probably the element of disruption that felt like maybe life had changed a little bit for a period of time, but it all went back to normal and it hasn't affected anything. And it, it's crazy, right? Is that what you expected? Uh, it's what I hoped. I don't know whether I had a particular expectation. And is that what you were scared about or fearful of? So this is, this is such an interesting word, that. And I, and I think, again, coming back to my personality type, the word even offends me. Scared? Are you joking? <laughs> so is that a masculine element? Is, yeah, probably. probably. Is, is, it, is, it, is it not? Is it just... I think everybody suffers from fear, right? Yeah. So inherently it, what... Human beings have fear. I think if, if for anybody to disregard it, go, oh, I'm not scared of anything. I think it's just the biggest load of bollocks, right? 100%. And one of, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, actually, is in relation to that. Because people call themselves brave but say they're not afraid of anything. Bravery can't exist without fear. That is, that is one of the best quotes for me. So you're either not afraid of anything, but you can't label yourself as brave, or you are afraid of stuff, but you're brave enough to go through that. And I definitely put myself into that category. Did I have fear around it? Of course I did. But was I going to let that derail me from doing what ultimately and morally I thought was the right thing to do, both for me and, and you needed to do, right? I needed to, yeah. And, and it's needs and wants, right? I think there's a lot of things in life where people want to do something and that's different to needing to do something, right? Yeah, 100%. But I needed to do it for me because, and again, we talk about personality types and character. My character is very much... What you see is what you get. I'm not ashamed of anything and I'm not, I'm not willing to hide anything for the sake of a better image. I am what I am and I'm quite proud of who I am and what I am. And if you don't like it, that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. Um, if that opinion happens to clash with me morally, i.e. you're racist, homophobic, sexist, uh, or any of the above, you're entitled to your opinion, but keep it well away from me uh, otherwise there will also be confrontation but I just do also accept there are certain type of people that I want in my life and certain people that I don't and actually by being me that's the way that you weed the people that you don't want in your life out of it and if somebody had a problem with my sexuality I don't want you in my life because I don't view you as a good person at the moment I'm not saying you couldn't be with education um, overcoming your ignorance accepting what you're afraid of because ultimately it all comes down from that as well but at the moment, you're not somebody I want in my life. In the same way that I wouldn't want to be friends with a racist, I wouldn't want to be friends with a sexist. So let's go back. I'm going to throw some spanners in the works here. Go ahead. Just because, because we can and we can talk sensibly about it, right? Ooh. Is that, because I always remember at school, right? And, and again, you know, I, I don't know what your school was like, but in our school, it was always like these little cliques. Of people who dressed certain ways, who, de who, who you know, they dressed certain ways, or they were, had certain characteristics. So it was like these little groups, like, you know, almost like the jock culture in America, right? And there was always this little thing where people wanted to be different, yeah. right? 
is that is this what people strive strive for all the time? People want to be different, but they also want to be the same in the in the same regard. It's a little bit weird, isn't it? You kind of want to belong to something, but you also want to stand out. And I think you know, social media is 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 a barrage of this. It's all these people who want to be different, but also want to stand out, and also want to be, you know, and and you know, people color their hair different. You know, they, they, they color their hair pink because they want to stand out. And and it's almost like this recognition thing. And, and you know, on the, the previous podcast, I talked to a, to a chap and it was the same sort of thing. It was all about recognition. And people ultimately, and I think this comes back to just the needs of human beings, right? Is that, do you need recognition? Is that something that, you know, the, this competitiveness, this this sporting thing, and, and deep down, is that what drives you? Is that what drives you, recognition? I've never met anyone that doesn't need it today. Yeah, likewise. I think there are different levels. I, I think that for me to try and bang a drum about being open and honest and then to come onto a podcast and say, no, I don't need recognition. This is all, everything I am is for me. It is a lot yeah. of nonsense. I think you have to have a level of self-awareness. Do, do I want recognition? Yes. Does everyone rec- want recognition at some level? I think so. Absolutely. Otherwise, why do you strive for achievement if no one's recognising that? I, I think where you want that from and in what form and to what level is where everything's quite unique to each individual yeah i think for me if i if i'm really honest with myself and i look back at my business career why have i been so driven to succeed i think it's to impress and get recognition from my father i i think that i looked at him and i think that he was this working class only child uh with a you know, probably craving more affection from his father, maybe craving slightly less affection from his mother <laughs> for a bit of balance. But he ultimately went out, worked his backside off and made a great life for his family. Uh, and, and what spurred him on, I think, was seeing his family enjoy that quality of life, that yeah, they yeah. Had holidays, traveling in nice cars, living in a nice house. And, and, and he would have got a sense of achievement from looking at where he's come from on a council estate in Wisbeach, having yeah. a council estate in, in the Northeast, to now looking at this large detached house in, in a suburb of Suffolk with his wife, his three children, his, his wife doesn't have to work and hasn't done since he met her. Um, yeah, I think he got a lot from that. That would have given him a, you know. And an, do you think you, you kind of subliminally picked up on that? Because again, you know, if, if somebody's not open with, oh yeah, this is why I was driven. And, and, and the interesting thing is, is that everybody I've spoken to so far, they've all pointed it back to a similar sort of route, right? Mm-hmm. Is that it's about recognition or impressing somebody else in their life, be it, you know, just somebody they've met or whatever it might be. And again, I can attest to my own life is that, is that all of the things that have driven me have been things where it's almost like proving people wrong, right? Mm-hmm. It's proving people wrong or, or doing something which, as a as a child or as somebody in, in the young years didn't feel right i.e you don't want to see people struggle right yeah. you know and i think when we talk about money and finances and things like this i mean ultimately it comes down to people not struggling and and you know by the sound of it you, you know you're pointing back and going look this was about recognition and i want to do well to impress not just my peers but all but my parents or my parent or or both or, or a bit of both or whatever it might be and everybody seems to point back to, I'm driven by something. And I think so many people have problems analyzing what that is. Yeah. And actually determining where that, and whether it's negative or positive. That's yeah. always a debate that we have on this is that, you know, this is a topic we come up, up against quite often. And it's always this debate, was that a negative thing or was that a positive thing? And ultimately where you are now, I would look at it and go, man, that was a massive positive. I go, Matt, that's pushed you to where you are now. And that's been a key driver to that. And that's, that's formed the man you are today. And, and you've got to be pleased with that, right? 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I always say I'm eternally grateful for my upbringing. Um, I, I think I had a great childhood, uh, a great education. Uh, the point I was going to come to earlier, and I got sidetracked, but, but maybe I'll come back onto it. Was it, it was a mixed education, but I, I, I'm even grateful for that. So I actually started off at a, a normal private school, sorry, a normal primary school, um, which was a state primary school. Um, and I was taken out of that a year earlier than everybody else because that was the first age that you could get into uh, the, the private school that my parents wanted to send yeah. me to. So I was pulled out a year early. All of my friends remained at that state primary school. 
that was, I remember even now, vaguely, that was difficult for me because I'd formed these friendships and I had my place in that school. And like you said, even about the cliques, that happens even at primary school and, and my friends were there and I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to be taken out of that to go to this posh school that my parents wanted me to go to. I resented that uh, and, and kicked up all hell <laughs> for, for a few weeks because of it. Uh, you know, being as difficult as possible to get my, my, for my mum to make me eat my breakfast, to get me into the car. It was a struggle for her every day for yeah. a few weeks until actually I formed new friendships and met new people and then I was fine. I stayed at that school until I was 15, um, at which point there was a, there was a joint decision uh, between my parents, me and the school for me to leave that school. Yeah. And that was ultimately because... Um, of my nature I'm very outspoken and if I see injustice or what I perceive to be injustice I deal with that I don't shy away from it and I felt at that school there was some by the way there were some fantastic teachers at that school uh, and some fantastic people but there were also some teachers at that school who were earn, earning a whopping big salary because they were teaching at such a expensive private school and developed an ego from that of being untouchable, feeling untouchable in their own little bubble of that private school. Having been there 15, 20 years, they, they very much viewed that as their place. And yeah, they can do whatever they result, want. I they could do whatever they want and, get, and they thought they could get away with it. And with most children, I guess, at 13, 14, 15, you, you probably can. Or even if you get challenged, you'll ultimately be able to be the teacher and be in charge. I saw some things at that school in classrooms, which I wasn't gonna stand for, even at 13, 14, 15. So for some of those teachers, I was their favorite pupil. For certain other teachers, I was the devil child um, and a problem student. Um, they were bullies to 13, 14 year old children. And I was <laughs> probably, well above my station and perhaps you know some people would say well it wasn't your place and perhaps it wasn't but I felt it was at that time and I would stand up to them publicly in front of other students defending my peers when I thought they were wrongly treated or harshly treated that got me in a lot of hot water you know over a couple of years and I wasn't willing to and this is this has been consistent with me my whole life I wasn't willing even at that age to bend on my morals just because of authority. authority. But that's cool. I, I think that's a really cool trait. I think the, the fact that you, you like, like what I was saying before, is people, people stand for things, but they don't understand what they're standing for, right? Mm. And they only do it half-heartedly. At the end of the day, if you're going to stand for something, stand for it. Yeah, that's it. You know, the, you know you, again, social media, riddle with it, right? People who are kind of half on the fence about something is that, you know, you saw something, you didn't like it, you stood for it, and you stood your ground. And, and I think part of that whole developmental prospect of that is that sometimes when you stand your ground you realize you're wrong yes and it's that ability to go mm. yeah, yeah i stood my ground based off what i know right now and and again you talked about ignorance right is that part of the problem with society right now is you know in in so many different aspects and and even you know with, with covid that, that everybody's been dealing with is ignorance right is that people don't know people don't know the full story yeah. So therefore, they prefer to remain ignorant and just kind of make up and fill in the gaps themselves. And I think that's what people do with a lot of things in society, right? They just fill in the gaps. They, they, they fill in the gaps and decide for themselves what the outcome is. And then ultimately, I think a great trait that certain people have is being able to go back and go, yeah, but I was wrong. Yeah, 100%. I had a view then that was wrong. And, and my view now is different because I'm more intelligent. I've learned more. I'm less ignorant about something. And, and, and I think even as kids, you know, you fill in gaps, don't you? You know, you are ignorant. I will put my hand up. I'll say I was, I was ignorant as a child on a lot of topics because I kind of thought I knew what, the, what it was about, but I didn't. I just picked little bits of information up along the way and, and, and assumed I could fill in the gaps, and they were right. 100% Phil, but that, that, that's the difference between somebody that wants to be better and craves to learn and somebody that has no interest in learning or developing and just wants to do, take the lazy option, which is my opinions are this, they are right. I can't be bothered to, to educate myself or align to myself. So I'm going to defend my position, my own narrative that I've created or oh, yeah. that society has created for me. The best example I can give you of what you've just said is actually, again, my parents. So 
and it comes into what, what I've just said about myself. And I think I've read some stuff about this, right? So, well, there might, there's probably two examples then. I think I know what you're talking about. But this one is actually something I've never spoken about publicly because even I am a little bit ashamed that they once had this attitude, um, even though, you know, they don't now and they, and they got over that very quickly. But you've got to, you've got to imagine, you know, my parents are 74, approaching 75. They're a different generation. Mum born and raised in Belfast during the Troubles, uh, very feisty, very strong woman, um, but old school. Dad, you, I've already spoken about, also very old school. My sister um, got into a very serious relationship, which she hid from my parents for the best part of a year um, because she, ha she had a fear about um, introducing him to the family and what their reaction may or may not and, be. And that's that topic we talked about before, right? Is it the, the fear, right? Drives a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. And um, she had no uh, base as to justify whether they would react in the way that she fears because they'd never been racist, actively racist. Yep. <clears throat> never said anything racist, never shown any signs of racism. But they are old school and from a certain generation. My sister's partner was black. And when it got very, very serious, she knew that she had to obviously introduce him to, to the rest of the family. I can't remember how old I was, but I think I was around eight years old, maybe 10, eight to 10. Yeah, yeah. Um, possibly. And my parents' reaction wasn't negative in the sense that they were what you would call aggressively racist or hateful but they were concerned. And to me, to me at, at eight to 10 years old, hearing your two greatest role models talk in the kitchen while you're stood in the hallway, yeah, yeah. About how they don't think that they should be together because it will cause problems for any children that they have because they'll get bullied at school because they're mixed race. They'll be confused because they're mixed race. That doesn't come from a place of hatred. It comes from a place of fear and a place of concern. But I was furious with them. And I was furious because of how let down I felt by not just their attitude, but, but by their willingness to comply with what they thought society wanted them to comply with. So and, and that comes down to stereotypes again, right? Is that your, 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 your sister almost stereotyped your parents in thinking that their response is going to be X or Y, right? Yeah. So yeah. straight away, we're, you know, we're all guilty of it, aren't we? We are. Um, but I also, even then, thought, I'm looking at this guy who's made such an amazing life off his own back. Yeah. From, and made his sister happy in, in it, you know, indefinitely, right? Exactly. And, and exactly, exactly that. So one of his goals was for his family to be happy. And yet you're considering that you pressure her to no longer be with the person that she's fallen in love with, being with for a year because of what society thinks. To me, that's weakness. And, and, and I don't know if I can swear on your podcast, yeah. but... I'm, like, well, my view even then was fuck society. Fuck what other people think. There's right and there's wrong. If you're on the side of right and you firmly believe that, just like I'm doing now in LGBT, if you believe you're right and you're comfortable with that, then the hell with what anyone else thinks. You need to do what's best for society. And if you need to drag people along that journey with you to improve the scenario for future generations, then you bloody well do it. And I looked at this man who at that time was my idol, my dad. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you fucking coward. How dare you even contemplate worrying about what people outside of the people you care most about in the world think, as opposed to thinking about who you care about the most in this situation. Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah, his, yeah, completely. His argument back to me was, yes, but I'm going to care just as much about those grandkids and they're going to suffer because of it. And my answer was, first of all, you don't know that. Second of all, if everyone has the attitude that you've got now, that will never change. Yeah, it's we presumptuous, isn't it? It's presumptuous. And, and it, like you say, it's, it, it's, it's a point where they're, they actually, they care or they're alluding to the fact they care, which I'm sure happened a lot with a lot of people where they alluded to, you know, I don't want to be seen as, you know, stereotyping anybody or whatever it might be, but I'm going to make out that I'm cared about, you know, I'm caring about what the grandkids' lives are going to be like. Which again is like, you know, it's, it's like anything generational is that you don't know what the world's going to be like at that point. Exactly. You, know, you don't know how it's going to change. And 
and, and maybe they did. Maybe they, you know, those generations maybe just assumed that the world was going to continue as it was. Yes. You know, it was going to be the same 10 years. So therefore, this is the outcome that's going to occur when in fact, you know, and I mentioned it several times before about evolution, right? We have this evolution of society and this evolution of what's, what's normal, what isn't normal, you know, what is normal, you know, how do you perceive that? And, and how society has evolved in so many different aspects, you know, and, and, you know, we talk about the evolution of like performance, right? is that, you know, people talk about performance and they're like, oh, performance, like sports, yeah? When, no, it isn't. It's about life, right? And, and uh, performance is about life. And you apply all these performance principles to work and business and your, your outside life and all those different things, right? And you bring them all to the fray. So we're going, so I mean, amazing points. And we're getting into this sort of almost like heavy psychology, right? of the psychology of different generations and how that's progressed and how it's got to, to where, where we are now as a society, but also, you know, let's get into what you've been, you know, been doing of late. And this is, this is all, all transpired from your opportunity to, you know, again, and again, if I'm terming this wrong, Matt, just pull me up on it, but almost your acknowledgement and, and, uh, I'm trying to say like awareness of being true to yourself, right? Is that all of a sudden you decide, look, I've got to be true to myself here, which is, is kind of from what I've read and what you've told me, I think is kind of how it panned out, right? Is that all of a sudden you're like, hold on, something doesn't add up here. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not being honest with myself. I'm not being true to myself. And in 2018, was it? 2018 January 2018 right so tell us what happened in 2018 so I was sat in this exact room actually without um, the amplifier behind you with, with a red wall that said escape on it <laughs> <laughs> there's um, a pattern here there is there is and uh, a message came through um, on Instagram saying um, you, you've got a new follower and uh, they'd like to picture and at that time, I was very new to Instagram, I, I must admit. I, I, I was kind of behind the times with that platform. All my friends had got on it in, in kind of that six month boom where it became massive. And um, I was just dragging behind. And I thought it was just picture sharing. Why, why do we want to get involved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of my friends were, oh, come on, come on, come on. And I thought, all right. So I set myself up an account. And then you know, a few months later, I've only got a couple of hundred followers. I, I pretty much know all of them quite well. And then this one person follows me from um, London. So I'm thinking maybe this is a business acquaintance. Should I know this person? Looked at their profile, didn't recognize them. It didn't seem to have anything to do with health and fitness in any of their posts. So I thought, hmm, okay. Uh, right, interesting. A few days went by uh, and I thought, well, they've followed me. They've, they've liked a photo, but then nothing. And normally, unless it's a... It, it, at that time, by the way, I must stress, unless it was a business, customer, colleague, etc., business relationship, or a family or, or friend of mine, the only other people that would have added me on social media of some sort would have been, at that time, either the odd gay guy or the odd um, woman who would add me and then within a, a, a short period of time message me. Drop your message, time. right? Yeah, slide into your DMs. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, Matt. <laughs> uh, that didn't happen and I think part of me was a bit offended by this because I thought well I know I don't know you professionally now you're not one of my friends and you're not one of my family members so why have you added me but then not contacted me so I actually slid into his DMs and said something along the lines I'm going back a while now um, you yeah, know dementia started to, to creep in you're uh, adamant about this age thing really kicking in now, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Recently been my birthday, you see, so clearly it was on my mind. Um, and I said, sorry, do I know you? And the response back was uh, something along the lines of, no, I don't think so. Why do you want to? Or something like that. It was something like that. And I was just like, hmm. And that really was probably that moment where for the first time in my life, I actually thought to myself, I do want to know you. And I'm starting to be attracted to a guy here, a guy that I've never met that has in the most random possible way come into my world. And don't forget, Phil, 
I had gay guys that had messaged me or tried to contact me throughout all of my twenties and never even remotely been interested or thought. Yeah, I think anybody, anybody in you know the health and fitness sector, I think, has, has probably experienced the same thing, right? Yeah, you know, very- if you know you, and it's it's just that's what people do. They're very boisterous kind of people. They're very you know, very confident people, aren't they? So, so I think that's, that's just something where, and you, you know, random is messaging and all of a sudden just got, Oh wow. They got to the point. And it's, yeah. it was that kind of thing, right? Yeah. But and this guy hasn't got to the point at all. Hasn't that, even messaged. And that might be the difference because right. at no point before him had I even remotely, it's not like I've, I've got these messages from people and being like, or, uh, you know, I need to pretend I'm not interested or I need to hide it or, you know, there was no way. Yeah. It, was, it was a genuine, yeah, look, I've got no problem with gay people. You know, and I would always, for some reason, go out of my way to say that, to, to not appear homophobic. Uh, but, you know, that's not me. It's not what I'm into. Um, but, but all the best kind of thing. Whereas this time, because he hadn't got to the point, he wasn't direct, I actually found myself flirting with him first. Yeah, yeah. Conversation developed you know, asking what his tattoo said and, and all of that kind of stuff to, to start this conversation going. And that was my awakening of, do you know what? I think I might be gay. And it was just like that. It was just all of a sudden it was just like, I think I might be gay. It, that, yeah. It, I mean, I, I don't, I can't sit here and say I asked myself that question on the day, but I was aware very, very quickly on that, on the same day that this all happened, the conversation. Yeah started but I was attracted to this person I was aware of that what I went through over the next three months maybe maybe two months was getting my head around the fact of is this a one-off because this has never happened before is this guy just you know your soulmate or the one guy or for for whatever reason like all the all the crazy ways that your brain would process this scenario that, that would lead you to trying to give yourself an answer that you might actually want, which is, is this just a one-off? Is this just a phase? Is Almost like trying to rationalize yeah. the output, right? Is that, exactly. you know, it, it's what you do with anything, right? Any big, big call in life. It's like you, you try and rationalize and go, well, what's brought me to this place? You know? Exactly. And that kind of is what I wrestled with. And, and then the moment I first met him, I even, even though it was still this one person, I knew as soon as I met him that I'd never felt that before. And I also was self-aware enough to know that that wasn't necessarily because I don't believe in love at first sight. I I, I personally think it's impossible. I believe in lust at first sight. I, I believe that you can have a connection with somebody that's built up before you physically meet them nowadays in particular, but love it. I think love is a very deep, deep thing that, that, that I think it's very difficult to know enough about somebody to know whether I think there's so many intricate details to you know yeah. to, to, to almost apart from obviously family and blah 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 which again is kind of a probably a, a genetic thing or whatever it might be or you know there's some kind of connection there right but there's I think there's just so many intricate parts of it where you don't know enough about somebody to know whether because it's a character right you've got to love someone's character you've got to love you know how someone is how someone acts how someone behaves and blah 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 so there therefore yeah i'm, I'm kind of with you on that one yeah uh, and but i did know that whatever i was feeling i'd never felt it before and in this lust at first sight i guess i had had relationships with girls my whole life and they'd never worked out and i would self-sabotage them on every single occasion yeah. I would blame work and being too career-minded, too focused, too driven, didn't have time for a girlfriend, which was partly true, but I made it that way. I still yeah, managed to... Yeah. You, you drove that to the forefront to go like, this is my excuse, this is my get-out almost, right? Which I think a lot of people do in all, all manner of scenarios, right? Is that you, you sabotage your... You know, we're, we're in the health and fitness sector, right? People sabotage their weight loss because, again, we, we talked about it before, fear, right? Because people, people are scared of what life's going to be like on the other side. Mm. you know is that and, you know much like you said with your sister right your sister was you're scared of what what's life going to be like after i drop this what i appear to think right now is going to be a bombshell right you know what what what's life going to be like after that point because i've got this pivotal point where i'm going to say something or do something then all of a sudden there's going to be this boom, everything's either going to split and go in different directions or it's going to continue as it was on the same path my, my fear back then I always knew that I didn't want that long-term relationship with any of the girls I was with. Yeah. 
I always knew that from early. In a couple of on a couple of occasions, I convinced myself that that would grow on me if I gave them a proper chance. But it, ultimately, it was nothing to do with them at any point. It wasn't about giving them a proper chance or whether they were the right person for me or whether they were good enough for me. Ultimately, what I know now is they were the wrong sex for me. That was the problem. I mean, some of the girls I, I look back on now and think, Jesus, if I was straight, if I was genuinely straight back then, um, I would have married them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. one of my ex-girlfriends, probably the, yeah, the last girl that I was ever with properly, uh, amazing. I mean, successful in her own right, great career, very intelligent, stunningly good looking, uh, sweet, kind, uh, wanted a family. My fear in that scenario was messing her around because I knew ultimately that yeah, I- Yeah, good person, right? Yeah, so I was, I was very, very honest, always from the get-go, because I was conscious that I didn't want to lead anyone up the garden path. But the problem is, Phil, no matter how honest you are with somebody about, by the way, I'm not really a commitment person, I'm really married to my work, I, I play football all the time, I don't have time for a lot else, I, I don't really want that whole... I kept the football one in reserve. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. Can't chuck that one in there. I, I, you know, I play football, so this ain't going to I think that'd be really harsh. But, but, but if a girl wants to try a, and turn that around, not knowing what you didn't know, which was, which yeah, was yeah, yeah. reality, um, they will naturally believe that over time they can do that, I think. And it just never happened for me. So I was with Kerry for a year almost. And I ended that and it broke my heart. To, to yeah, end. because of what, what in, inherently it did to her, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the time that I may have wasted, knowing yeah. that she wants a family and to get married and have a kid, knowing that you've wasted that person's time when, even if you were honest at the beginning about you know, where you were at, um, it's not a nice feeling to have. And I made the decision from that moment, I'm not going to get into a relationship with a girl again. Not, not certainly in the short term, until I'm 100% sure I'm ready for that. And actually, 12 months later, I met uh, this chap um, in, in, like I say, the, the strangest of ways. And, and then I, that was my epiphany. That, that was when I knew. And that was 2018, right? January 2018. Right. So, so we talked about this briefly at the start about, you know, the paths kind of going either that way or that way. And obviously th there's this fear at this point. Firstly, you had to come to terms with this yourself because all of a sudden you were like, oh, hold on. I've been doing something kind of ultimately sort of wrong for the, you know, however many years of my life. And, and I've only just figured out why. And I think this is this, this thing that some people along the way need help with. They need someone to pinpoint that, you know, what is that thing that causes them to self-sabotage something? What is that thing that causes them to go off in a different path? What is that thing? And whether we're talking about business, fitness, whatever it might be, is that, you know, ultimately you've dealt with people in, in fitness, right? Where they need to know what is that turning point? What's going to get that person to turn the right way? And then what are they scared of when they go that way? Because obviously they make a decision. You know, people make decisions to, you know, not to trivialize this, but, but ultimately if somebody makes a decision to lose weight, they've also got to take the consequence of losing weight with them. Is that, you know, somebody who's in their 40s who's been overweight most of their life, they, they've probably carved their lifestyle out around, you know, eating out, yeah. socializing with friends, you know, which typically involves drinking, their friends probably have a very similar lifestyle pattern, i.e. They, they exercise in the same modalities and do the same things, right? And we surround ourselves by people who, who typically similar-minded, similar habits, behaviors, blah, blah, blah. That's what we do in society, right? Is that, and then they've got to go, hold on. This thing that I'm going to change about myself is going to change my entire world. Yeah. Which makes me scared of it. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, you're like, Wow. I've now got to tell my world that have got used to Matt Morton being the guy he was. And I think I read in one of your interviews where he said something to like one of your, it was either one of your best mates or something like that. And he, his first reaction was, are you kidding? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's because all of a sudden it's like, even they're shocked, let alone you yourself, right? That you've had this epiphany that all of a sudden something that you've been doing in your life wasn't really what you wanted to be doing in your life. Right. So, so tell me about this, where you thought there's potentially going to be this divergence of people are not going to get this, all of a sudden everything's going to change, blah, blah, blah. And you said right at the very start of the podcast, you said things I expected to change, and then they, they kind of didn't. And everything went back to, again, to, to put in brackets, uh, normal. 
back yeah. to your normal life, right? What you perceived as normal, right? So tell me about that. So the things that I thought would change are uh, actually business. I thought, because so, you, build, you build relationships, don't you, for a long period yeah. of time. And the, even the relationships that you built with women, you kind of wonder in the back of your mind, and this is probably absolute blind arrogance that has no place at all, but you wonder whether is part of that, that really good relationship that you might have with a female colleague or customer, is that partly related to them having a level of, of attraction to you? And, and if it is, is you telling them that you're gay going to affect that relationship, which you clearly don't want it to? So that was, that was one consideration. That's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? It is. It is. Really interesting dilemma. Is that, you know, because ultimately if they, if they, you know, they may be attracted to you, uh, and they're still going to remain attracted to you, but they weren't going to get you in the first place and they're not going to get you in the second place. Which is exactly right? what I came around to thinking, yeah. And also... I had to give them more credit than that. Uh, are they attracted to me as in because we have a good relationship and, and our personalities match versus, you know, are they looking at you physically and thinking, you know, core? I think that's just, that was just my arrogance. So, and then I just thought to myself, get over yourself. <laughs> Nothing to do with that. Everything's going to be fine. And actually, in a lot of those cases, I remember telling some of these, um, these people and they were fantastic. They were great. Um, and still are, you know, customers, friends, colleagues, etc. So what was the overall response? What was the resounding response? Was there a response or were they just like, yeah, okay? Not a single person, Phil, was, oh, okay. That's the interesting thing. And part, and part of that is almost why I'm doing what I'm doing now, because that exactly should be the response in a perfect world. What, All just, right. yeah, okay? All right. So what well, were the responses? There were only one obviously three. there's lots of them, but what, what what was the overall resounding response? So I always try and segment this answer into you can only get one of three. It's a negative, it's a positive, or it's a neutral. Right. But, yeah, different actually, iterations of a negative, a positive, or a neutral, right? Hundred percent. You just gave a neutral reaction, which is the perfect scenario. It shouldn't be a big deal, but it also shouldn't be a problem. I've had zero barring two negative reactions i've had i th i think i'm just going to jump in here i think if i'd known you for a long time before and i think my reaction would have been wow really okay <laughs> because you are like this you're this alpha dude you know and again not to stereotype but you you are this alpha male football playing yeah. you know charismatic you know, and, and, and it's just, I, I think that would be my reaction. I think about be like, wow, because you, 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 because of the way that you are, you are this very, you know, almost, and I think blokey blokey is the wrong term, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. Actually, you, you've just probably proven me to, to have been a liar there because your reaction from memory in the car, which is when you first found that out, yeah. was exactly what you just said. Actually. Was it that? It was. Said, wow. And you then were, I was like, oh, okay. You were surprised, but there, you weren't overly positive. I asked, oh, brilliant, it's amazing. Oh, you, you're so strong. But I also so, didn't know you well enough to do that. No, but you, but you also weren't negative. So pro probably actually you were, you were the one indifference to that, to that rule. But everybody that I'd known for, as you just said, for a longer period of time, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 33 years, um, was actually all very positive uh, uh, and you know to, to to the point where I felt really happy that they were positive but also slightly embarrassed by it being such a positive <laughs> thing. I thought it should be neutral like, or is, I don't had, is that because you had a, that fear that you were kind of almost anticipating that response and it wasn't the one you expected I think it's more to do with what you touched on earlier was it is it my preconceived internal idea of masculinity creeping in where people are saying it's amazing you're gay oh it's brilliant you're gay that's fantastic that's brilliant yeah. and I'm, I'm alpha male matt morton is in here saying is it brilliant or or is it just neutral should it not matter it's not brilliant yeah yeah, yeah. they're not a problem it just like, so let's move on and and you know and at that point they also lack the context of where you were in your head right yeah. because ultimately you said before that that you all of a sudden had this epiphany and then had to almost deal with that yourself because you were like, Oh, Oh my God, that makes sense now. 
Mm. Is that all of a sudden now this stuff that didn't make sense to me before and this sabotage in relationships and blah, 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 all of a sudden this makes sense to me now. I had, I had an extra... And then they might have thought that you were in that process, right? Yeah. So, so I, just, I just probably had an extra... By the time that a lot of them knew, I had 18 months to process this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was 18 months ahead of them, exactly as you've just said. Now, what is interesting to pick up on what you just said is that their reaction of what, what, wow, um, okay, are you sure? Uh, I didn't see that coming. Their initial reaction of shock, some of them who when then came out of it and then started to process it and look backwards with hindsight, yeah, yeah. then said, oh, I can see that actually. Oh yeah, no, I did think that. <laughs> I, I, but I, that's I, stereotyping again, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's exactly yeah. what we're talking about, is that I've stereotyped you as this alpha male because that's what our perception is straight away and that was my response hence was wow really okay to then to then now you're going they they they've actually then looked back on oh yeah you've done all these stereotypical things that expect a gay man to do yes and it's stereotyping again right so they're they're like, like, oh yeah that makes sense and i'll give you some examples i have had people even good mates say to me yeah i suppose i did always think that you were a bit too vain to be straight <laughs> <laughs> I've, had people, I've had people say to me, oh, it's always the good looking ones that are gay. I've had people say, which I actually I take as a compliment, to be honest. Yeah, um, I take that on it. Uh, but I've also had people say, you know, oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I did think to myself that because you never had a girlfriend for very long, that you might be. And, and I, my response back to them is, no, you didn't, because you would have said it at the time. You used to actually. Yeah, it's, it's like that expectancy mates, right? It's like when you break up with somebody and they go, yeah, they weren't right for you. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why didn't you say yeah. you're my mate? You're meant to tell me these things. What what they actually uh, what they actually thought was that I was just a bit of a non-committal, maybe yeah, yeah. put me in the bracket of a bit of a player, which couldn't have been further from the truth. <laughs> you know, I, I was just um, wrestling with myself about you know these girls I was dating, and that's why. But I, I think again, that's a stereotype, right? Yeah. You know, you're a good-looking dude, and and you know you 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 dress very well. You know you you know you look after yourself. You know. You could stereotype you as a bit of a player, right? Because ultimately you could if you wanted to. That's very kind of you, Phil. I'm glad I came on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, there you go. There's the compliment. Here's the one compliment. No, but, it, but it, you know, without, again, I don't want you to sound arrogant here, but, but you know, that's factual is that, is that you could be perceived as that guy as that person who, who maybe is a bit promiscuous and bouncing from relationship to relationship. You know, if, if somebody didn't know you better, right? Yeah. If somebody just looked at you on face value and you said about before about, you know, I don't believe in true love, of, uh, love at first sight, I believe in lust at first sight, which is you look at someone, you make a perception. And this is what human beings do, right? Yeah. You look at someone and you make a preconceived idea about them. And then you're like, oh my God, they're not quite what I expected. I've met people, you know, in the health fitness sector and I'm like, yeah, that dude's going to be arrogant and all right, you know, pig headed and blah, blah, blah. And then you talk to them and like, oh my God, I just completely stereotype them. Yeah. And I feel really bad about it. We all do it. We yeah. all human beings do it. Yeah. But this is this comes back to what you were saying before about I mean the mind is a very powerful thing, but you need to train it and you need to educate it. And, and actually we need to keep learning about what we do. We need to keep learning about how we stereotype and actually keep breaking some of these stereotypes in order to become better at doing it in the future. Which then, again, right, let's get into the, the nitty gritty of what you're doing right now. So as I said, I've, I've Googled you prior to you know, just to see if I could dig up any dirt or whatever it was on you. But it, no, I Googled you because I know that you've been in the news of late and there's been lots of articles, a lot of pieces about what you've been doing, uh, you know, actively and certainly in the world of football. Because again, football, this has been a, a big kind of stigma around football. And it's been this thing that, uh, again, there was, there was stuff about years ago, uh, you know, Justin Fashion, who's, who's again, you know, he's, he's become very apparent in the news again. And you brought to the fray. So tell me about what you've been doing of late. Tell me about what that whole intention is and, you know, that progression of that, that evolution of people. And again, we, we talked about this generational kind of difference and how important that sort of education is with generational changes, you know, views. We've talked about stereotypes a million times over the podcast, but this stereotype of where people are and what people perceive is going to be. And obviously the struggles that you had coming to terms with not, you know, not the outcome, but the, 
oh, I've got to tell people this, which again, I think is the thing that most people are fearful and scared of. And they're scared of this, the reaction that people are going to have to any kind of change to anybody in mm. life. And again, we've, you know, we've trivialized it in many respects with, with losing weight, which for many people isn't trivial, but you know, losing weight is that there's that perception of all of a sudden my life's going to change because my outlook is different. I, I, I have different expectancies and all those different things. So tell me about what, what's been happening with you, how it's affected you, all the positives, all the negatives, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's been a bit of a journey really. And, and it's been an education for me as well. And that has inspired me to do more and more and more as we've gone through. So clearly I was acutely aware that being a gay footballer was was definitely a niche um it was certainly not common niche. what an uh, interesting way of putting it yeah it is always looking for an angle <laughs> um it, it was very very uh uncommon and i just wasn't aware of how uncommon on a national scale until very recently you got to appreciate that i was looking at this in terms of my environment originally so i have to first of all i have to be true to myself Ultimately, if I'm not, knowing my personality type, I'll feel like a fraud. I'll feel like I'm fake. I'll feel like I'm hiding something and therefore ashamed of something. And none of that sits well with me. So that was never going to happen. So that's why I addressed it. That's why I announced it. Um, it wasn't because I didn't fear any consequence. It wasn't because I, I wasn't afraid of any possible reactions. It was because my character uh, and my sense of morality i think was prepared to take any consequence that came as a result and would have dealt with that i was pleasantly surprised that all of the reactions were very very positive like i said bar barring two um which i which are the two that i expected would be the most difficult anyway uh in a football environment it's actually made a lot of change and positive change to the point where I was talking to somebody this morning uh, who's making a documentary about all of this. And even I used to use homophobic slurs in, in the football environment. Oh, that's gay. Oh, you're gay. All oh, right, gay boy, like whatever. Like even things like up and down the country in almost every football game, somebody will be called a puff on the pitch because they've dived or they've been kicked and they're, they're shouting about it or whatever. Now, does that mean that the person saying it is always homophobic and has hatred in them? No, it, it simply doesn't. It is a cultural and systemic problem that has made that type of language commonplace in the sporting environment. And since I've come out, I haven't used those slurs. <clears throat> Not a single person in my teams have used those slurs. Not a single opponent has used those slurs because they are all aware. It just at least, at the very least, gets people thinking about what they're saying. That's really That's interesting because a lot of these things are, are a bit like, you know, it's, it's vocabulary, right? It's dialogue, it's vocabulary. And, and I'm sure that a lot, of, a lot of the times that people use these words, they don't mean it as a derogatory slur, right? They just, it's part of vocabulary. It's part of something that people have used as a, as a, as a term for, you know, whatever somebody being, you know, a certain way or, or characterizing something that somebody does. Right. And I think that's, that's, that's also a language thing. And I think that, you know, we have that challenge, I think across all kinds of levels of, uh, you know, racism, homophobia, or all those different things. And I think we've got this use of vocabulary that needs to evolve and also almost understood to some degree. And, and you know, certainly in racism, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of terms there which are kind of almost perceived as not terms of endearment by any means, but terms that they're okay to use in certain circumstances, but not okay to use in others. And it's this vocabulary and this vocabulary that is associated with a... a you know, whatever agenda stereotype or whatever it might be, which is, which is interesting in itself. But then the fact that somebody can an, immediately eliminate a word or a term that they've probably used subconsciously for many, many years is, 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 is crazy. It's, it's fascinating that all of a sudden these people are like conscious of your really just you, right? There's only you 
you know, you're, you're the only kind of guy on your team that has, has came out as openly gay, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's only really you and your feelings that they're altering this behavior for, which is tantamount to, you know, the impact that you've had is, is phenomenal, right? And you must take some kind of pride in that and in that you go, wow, all these, all these guys on the pitch have all changed their behaviors because of me, because they don't want to offend me and they don't want to, you know, uh, you know, they don't want to stereotype and they don't want to, you know, use a derogatory term or what would be deemed as a derogatory term in certain contexts, right? And and they've just stopped doing that. And that is, that's pretty amazing, right? What an impact you, just you on your own have had, right? It is, it is. And, and you use a really key word there, conscious. Yeah. <clears throat> Before that word was being, <clears throat> clear my throat now, excuse me, Phil. Before that word was being used unconsciously or subconsciously without any thought. So that was just what automatically out of habit came out of people's mouths left, right and centre. And again, it all comes back down to this association with masculinity and the sport and and lots of systemic and ideologies. Um, But that stopped and pretty much overnight. It's wild, right? So... I actually think that that's credit to the players and the opponents because that shows you they weren't saying that in the first place to cause offence to somebody that may or, or may be gay or is gay. They weren't saying it because they thought people were actually gay and they weren't saying it because they were homophobic or, or had any hatred or dislike for gay people. So that, that's a massive positive. They were saying it because it was a way of getting under someone's skin, it was a commonly traded insult, and it was something that was done out of habit. The problem is that the consequence from their actions of saying this 10 times a game, 10 times a training session, five times in a dressing room, from all over the place, is any closeted gay player in that environment has to- all of a sudden like, whoa. And they will be thinking, no doubt in my mind, and I know this for a fact, because don't forget, there was a period of, 18 months between me realizing that I was gay and me telling everybody. Yeah, of course. So there's acknowledgement and (laughs) making people aware, right? Yes. So as a result of that, I had a period of time in a dressing room on a football pitch while players were using these slurs. And And were you offended by it all of a sudden? I wasn't offended. I was was not offended. You were aware of it more? I was aware. Because before, you've got to remember, I was using them and not even thinking about it, not using yeah, it yeah. To, to, for the same reasons. <clears throat> not, probably not even conscious I was using them. And I was, I was hearing them from everyone else. It, it was commonplace. Uh, but it never affected me because I wasn't aware that I was gay. As soon as I was aware that I was, and then I stopped using that language, and then I could hear other people still using it, when you're going through a process mentally of when am I going to tell these people, when am I going to come out, and you hear that left, right, and centre every week, you are thinking, hmm, you know, shit, how's that going to go down then? Are they going to accept it? Are they going to like it? Are they going to be uncomfortable? And I'm not for a second, Phil, just because I know what my character's like, my personality's like. I did not think at any point any single player in my dressing room was going to turn around to me and be confrontational or derogatory or aggressive about it. In fact, I was 100% confident that would never in a million years happen. What I did think there was a chance of is a player might not say anything and then subtly leave the club and then say something on social yeah, media yeah, yeah. or uh that might be the reason or does a player act differently in the dressing room because you've got to remember this is a this is a change room that you know 20 percent of the time you've got fully grown men walking around naked showering together and whatever else does, does that even that behavior change if they realize that somebody in the dressing room is gay now i have no interest physically in any of my teammates that's no yeah. for them but i don't have you just drop that bombshell now well, uh, you're offended by that now they're already like, accused. damn him. They're already, some of them were a bit like that. Some, so, so some of my friends were like, hang on a minute. Why have you never tried it with me then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost like it's a, it's a, what, what so I'm not attractive. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's a recognition thing, right? I usually, I, recognition. I usually answer it by saying, you don't want me to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have to, you have to then realize that in that period of time, if, I am even thinking about why they're using that language and how yeah. it's going to be. How is a less confident, 
maybe less senior figure in a dressing room. Of course, because at this point, you're player manager, right? I was, at that time, I was player. Right. Wasn't but a re- respected player, right? Yeah, senior. Player. There a while. Yeah, prob- probably, in any dressing room, there's one to three more vocal, louder leaders. Of yeah, the yeah. yeah, definitely one of those. Um, so you can deal with it slightly differently. But it did make me think, and this is why I started the process of what's an 18 year old, 17 year old, 19 year old lad who's trying to break into the first team going to be thinking about revealing their sexuality to a boisterous vocal dressing room where you're not one of the leaders yet. Yep. Who are constantly calling each other puffs, gay, whatever else. How are they going to be fit? And that must be, that must be tough. And, so potentially, that- and potentially dealing with, obviously, a management, that are often in football clubs, right? Management are older. They're of a different generation. There's also that, that probably going over in your head where you're like, right, but they're of a different generation. They're not going to, they're not going to accept this quite like the players do who are of my generation who are more accepting or, or understand more and slightly less ignorant about the, 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 the subject. And, and they're, they're talking with that, right? So it becomes a massive challenge, right? Exactly. So I wanted to make a difference to that. That, that was my initial motivation. There, there was, I guess the journey was owning it myself, yep. dealing with it myself and doing that for me and, and to feel, I guess, because of my own, my own character traits, for, for in true Matt Morton fashion to be, this is it, this is me, like it or not, deal with it. Yeah, yeah. There was definitely an element of that. The next stage was, right, now what difference can I make to other people? But that was, a, that was initially kind of localised, our league, our area, anyone's welcome at Thetford Town, we're inclusive. Anyone that needs to talk, you can reach out to me. It will be confidential because I know that, that a lot of people suffering from that particular issue they have to talk and they don't feel comfortable or confident talking. So I was a safe place. Come and talk. And maybe riddled with the same challenges you had, right? Which was your parents. Yep. Because obviously if they come out to the, 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 the teammates, they've also got to come out to the parents, right? You know, so you, again, you've got that generational challenge there and you've got all that other stuff. But yeah, it's, it, yeah. Like you said earlier, relatable. That, that, that was how I, I, I thought to myself, for that player at the beginning of that journey, hearing my story makes me relatable, which means that I can make a difference to them. Yeah. So that, that, that was the key. Then I got contacted by journalists from the local newspaper for the kind of Eastern counties area yep. uh, who wanted to do a story on it. And I must admit, at first, I was, I was kind of at a crossroads of, right, do I kind of want to now just draw a line under this? I've done what I needed to do, draw a line under it and then carry on and, and, and let, you know, put the torch down for my sake yeah i mean i'm busy i've got a lot on how much do i want to really take this on or go the other way and think do you know what no you you could potentially be making a difference to people's lives if not saving somebody's life don't be so selfish you've got time you're almost going back to that point where you're making excuses of why you're not in a relationship i'm too busy i've got time you've got time make time it's important. So I did the article and the response was incredible at a local level. It was, you know, thousands of, of comments and everything else. It was messages of people. Anything negative? No. Amazing. That's um, incredible. It then took a year, just over a year. Um, sorry, no, it didn't. It was, it was a year from me announcing it on Instagram and, and having told all the football teams and families and friends and everything else until that happened. It was then a few months after that article where I got contacted by a journalist called John, John Holmes at Sky Sports News. Uh, in, incredible guy. Um, and he wanted to do a story for Sky Sports News nationally. And I, I thought it was a wind up. But well, hang on a minute. I'm a semi-professional footballer. You want to put me on national television and in national press to talk about me being an openly gay player. And it was only because 
and I didn't know this at the time, I had no idea, I was the highest playing openly gay footballer in the country. Crazy. Insane. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty good for our area and our level, I like to think anyway, but I am light years away from, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo in the Premier League. It's to think that I am the highest level openly gay player playing in this country for a modern Western country, or we like to think, is insane. And just to, just to put into context for the listeners that, that don't get football, so Premier League, first division, second division. Championship, division one, division two, league, well, league one, league two, league three, uh, conference. Uh, you go, you have to go down eight levels to me. Eight the, levels. Eight okay. levels. So it's good, but it's not great. Um, we get paid, we don't make a living from it. Yeah. That, that's what you're talking about. And um, it, was, it, it was really something that hit home with me that. It, it kind of made me realise, wow, we, we have a lot of work to do. And John, who was a journalist, was actually trying to do all of that by yeah. you know, stories like this. And, and I think he saw me as a bit of a, a vehicle to continually get this message out and make a difference to people. And he does a great job of that. And I just saw myself at that point as being able to make um, or, or form a small part of that. So I did. I guess from their perspective, you 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 know you, uh, you're not camera shy. You know you you're very eloquent. You 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 come across very well. You know you can speak. I mean, I, I guess their worst nightmare would be to have somebody who's then you know like the quiet kid in the corner who doesn't really want to speak to anybody who doesn't want to do anything. You you know they've got somebody who's quite you know you know strong willed. Uh, you know he's vocal. He's prepared to talk about these things and and he's prepared to take hopefully no consequence but the consequence if there is any uh you know the negatives the positives all of it that comes with anything like this and and you know they, they've kind of hit jackpot with you in that you know they can use it as that vehicle and you've openly said i'm going to be that vehicle for you that's your second complimentary uh statement in the that's th- all right I'll, I'll hit three by the time we're done you, you have to be careful it's like you- <laughs> attractive wife and children otherwise people start talking Bill <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah no I, I think that they did see that and and you know that that's all for the purposes of good so I'm, I'm on board with it what I didn't expect was the level of response I mean hundreds and th- hundreds of thousands of comments on their posts their feeds their social I didn't see any guy this was Sky. Right. Yeah. Obviously, I'm tagged, so, you know, I get quite a lot of viewage on that um, and, you know, additional followers and everything else, which now I look at and think, actually, that's quite a good thing because the more followers I have, the bigger the platform I have to make more of a difference now. Of course. That, that's, that's now something that I'm starting to think, actually, that's probably not a bad thing. I've never been bothered about followers on social media before because I've never had a, a message that I wanted to get out to an audience that, I thought we'd do yeah, it's no longer a vanity metric. It's actually useful. You know, it's a uh, useful metric, right? One hundred percent, absolutely. Um, and, and Sky was really the, the the silver the silver bullet for that um, because after Sky did what they did and it became national media, national press, national coverage with with hundreds and thousands of comments, the DMs went from with the local article you know, 50 odd messages, maybe a hundred messages. And some of them just to, just to positive comments rather than actually relatable, but a good five, six people who came out to me via DM, uh, had told me about their struggle, asked for advice. And that was, that was rewarding. You can magnify that response when Sky did what they did by the thousands. Wow. So, it, it, instead of hundreds of comments, it was hundreds of thousands. Instead of 50 DMs, it was, you know, 5,000. It, it, was, it was ridiculous. And, and I made a conscious effort to try and respond to everybody, even if it was just a, a, an acknowledgement of, of their... Yeah, just a thumbs up or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. But the, what struck me massively with that was the, the quantity of messages I've received from people that had given up the sport because of their sexuality or who had lost somebody because of their sexuality, brother, son, um, uh, friend, cousin, people that are taking their own lives, Phil, rather than 
uh, come out and people that are taking their own lives because years ago, the reaction that they felt that they got from coming out. Um, or even in some cases, right, what we've touched on is the, the, the thought of the reaction they were going to get. Yes. So they, you know, they never even got that far. Yes. The, the, the scary thing, and I think the, 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 the probably the most upsetting thing, I think from, from my perspective, you know, is, is talking to you and, and, and you telling me that I thought there was going to be this reaction and there actually wasn't. It was quite almost welcoming and people were like, yeah, cool, whatever. And, and to think that there's, there's, there's people who are, you know, of that probably not stress, strong word, but, but it, you know, they're in that uh, disposition themselves where they, they feel so overwhelmed by it all that yeah. they, you know, they, they choose a different path. And, and, you know, that's, that's just, it's incredibly sad, you know, to know that. And obviously you've had people message you and say, look, this has happened. And, and I mean, that's, that's horrendous. It is horrendous. And it's so horrendous that it becomes incredibly inspiring and motivating. Oh, massive driver for you to continue what you're doing, what you're doing, right? Absolutely. And, and, that, and that is now the sole reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, is it time consuming? Yes. Does it mean I give up extra time at weekends and evenings? Yes. But is there anything more rewarding than I do? I, 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 would, I love what I do with Amplify. Uh, it's an incredibly exciting project. We are, you know, hopefully on the brink of, of making some major waves in, in making the world a better place with, you know, free access to health, fitness and nutrition, partners, brands, content and everything to lead healthier, happier lives. But my, the buzz that I get from now being able to help people with a very direct real issue personally now from this work is on a par with anything else that I've ever done. That's amazing. I'm very conscious that we have been talking for a long time. Did warn you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Matt, it's been, been incredible. I'm, I'm not just going to just, just nullify it as it is here, but we'll, we'll kind of close it all off. But, uh, Obviously, you're doing work now. You're 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 still out there. You're doing interviews all all over the place, according to Google. You're you're speaking to everyone. You're making this you know a very vocal exercise for you. But if people want to know more about what you're doing, uh, you know, to 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 even just follow you, you know, social media is the Matt Morton, which we we indicated right at the very start. Uh, but how can they how can they contact you? How can they you know reach out to you? Whatever it might be. Yeah, so if anybody does want to contact me um, to talk about any of the subjects that we've spoken about, whether it be business, whether it be Amplify, whether it be LGBT um, or, or any of the media stuff or, or anything really, um, then you can follow me on Instagram at the Matt Morton, as we have discussed. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I am on Facebook and, and I'm relatively responsive to DMs on a lot of that. Probably Instagram is the best one. I'm probably more attentive to that and try and get back to as many people as possible. Um, but you can also feel free to email me at mmorton at amplifylife.com and I will do my very best to, to get back to you on that as well. That's awesome. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Very, very insightful, very interesting. Uh, you know, doing some great stuff uh, in in business and in life in general, which is, which is cool. And just keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, buddy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for your time. And we will speak again very soon, undoubtedly. We will. Take care. All man. right. Take care. Bye for now.